Hello, I'm terribly sorry about the audio tonight. I, I did say to you that we have storms and uh, it's uh, getting pretty bad. So again, I'm sorry for those that will listen to this call, those that may have logged off because... Um, uh, but we're back here. Um, so look, I'm going to try... Um, we're going to have another try at getting to speak to uh, Shambo. Uh, we're going to also um, ask if we can speak to others of you that want to speak to us but we'll probably wrap up in about another 30 minutes before the storms really hit. So look, uh, let me go and unmute Shambo again and see if I can get uh, get to speak to you. Uh, Shambo, can you hear us? Hi, Frank. This is Bob. Hi. Hi. How are you going, Rob? Oh, pretty good. Uh, hey, I was just curious. Uh, when you mention statute, what are you referring to? I'm referring to the statutes of the estate. So typically a statute of the estate will be an act. I'll call it an act of, of uh, parliament or an act of Congress, yeah? So for the Wills Act of 1837, that's a statute of the United Kingdom Parliament. And then if you go to, say, for example, uh, California, there might be called the, uh, the Will and Testament Act or the Wills and Estate Act, and it might be 1869, for example, or 1885, for example. Yeah? That's what I mean by statute. Yes? Okay. And I was just curious because, uh, you know, they've, you're probably aware of this. They've redefined the term statute in the court rules in Washington. Yes. I'm in the state of Washington. Uh, means any state statute, local or county ordinance, resolution or regulation, or agency regulation. And I was just curious on that. But Yeah, it's a, that's a really good point. In fact, it, it means I'm going to have to be a little bit clearer in what I mean, uh, because what you've just read out means that they can then use the codes that they've created now in each of the states and the, the one they're doing for the, for the big, big national plantation, which is the lawyers um, uh, taking the... Uh, what I would call statutes or the original acts and then interpreting them, rewriting them to how they believe them to be for the corporation. Yeah? That's, That's the exactly code. what's happened because most of the statutes or what we call RCWs are actually written by the code revisers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're not actually statutes by the legislative stuff, but I don't want to keep you all. But the RCWs up here also say that they shall use their corporate name. It's in Title 36, and I was wondering, uh, they use different terms because they, they'll use, when you get a summons, it can be Pondere County District Court, yep. and then it's, like you get a ticket, it says you appear in the County of Pondere. Yeah. So how can we do the public record where, what do we file with a dead entity? Well, this is what I was saying before, and it's really, really important. The, the, the corporate, the corporate um, cloak depends on the existence of the bones of the original estate acts, okay? It can't, it can't get rid of them. If it did, they wouldn't have anything there. You'd just be dealing with um, complete tyrants, yeah? There, there would be no law, yeah? And in fact, what happens is if they do away with them, then the, the law, if the law, the law is never absent of the land. If they do away with the original underlying statutes, then the law reverts to either the tribal law of the indigenous uh, nations or reverts to the higher Roman estate of the Commonwealth and the Crown. But you can't get rid of the law. If, if you remove one law, then another law comes in. The corporation does not have, and it cannot have law. It has codes and it has policies but it does not have law as we know it. That is done through the estates itself. So um, we need to find those original acts to see what is underpinning these corporate franchise codes. And if we can call on those, then that's how we get things through to the public record. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And uh, just one one brief point. Uh, most all the stuff we read, like in our, everything's a code, as you know. Uh, yeah. Most of that stuff, even to be a legislative act, has to be enacted by the legislature. And if you read a lot of them, they don't have that 
passage, be it enacted by the legislature, that basically makes some agency rules, and that's what I believe the courts, most of these courts, are enforcing, which we're not aware of. Well, exactly, but there's a reason why they've they've made it so flimsy. On one hand, it sounds like it's all a fraud, but remember, I you may have, you may not have heard me last week when I said that a couple of weeks ago about the appointment of an agent. That the presumption is when you go to court, you've appointed that uh, individual contractor with his nameplate open for business, the agent. So you've basically given him the business of of resolving the issue. Yeah. Right. I so, agree with you. Yeah, so if, if, if that presumption stands, they don't need this stuff. They don't need it to be approved. You've pretty much given them carte blanche to go and do whatever they want. So that's actually a better deal for the corporation than risking the legislature having on the record open treason, yeah? Well, absolutely, because they supposedly have to follow the Constitution, and when they delegate their authority to agencies, they're not under that. That's right. So it's better for them to keep it loose and run a whole system on presumption and automation where pretty much you, you uh, gamble on the stupidity of the people. And do you think they've been winning so far? Oh, absolutely. Right. Look, thanks so much for, for what you raised. I hope we answered some of those points for you. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again, everybody. And I'm sorry it's it's been such an up and down call in terms of uh, audio and technology. I'm just going to get on to Alpha 999 again. He's come back on, and then uh, please, if you've got questions, punch him into the chat or or press star eight hash eight. Hello, Alpha 999. Can you hear us? Yes, I can, Frank. Thanks. Um, I was wondering on this <clears throat> further on this will. If you have court matters, um, could you not prepare your will? Uh, with you as the executor and so forth, um, and just attach it to the court documents, like, like basically annex it into the into the uh, public side of the record. Is that going to work? Um, if you have a yes. pressing legal issue, you know that you, yeah, you don't have time to. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me come in from another way. Um, remember, the last few weeks I've really emphasised the power of of speech and the auricular power uh, of law, that it is and has always remained the central fact of law, that all law ultimately is spoken and any law and paper is memorialized. Yes? Yes. And the reason I raise that is, if you look at the Wills Act of 1837 and you look at everything that's taken place, it appears superficially that what they've done is they've usurped an ancient right over millennia, which was that one's will was always auricular and that they transferred it and made it that it must be written. In actual fact, they, did, they didn't do that. They can't undercut the underlying principle of law on which all law, back to the Bible, in fact, it's in the Bible, that, that it is all spoken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what it means is when you go to court, if you have to go to court, your spoken will by simply saying, it is my will and intent, cannot be challenged. The only thing the court ultimately can do is run on presumptions and test your competency. Yes? Yeah. But, but it cannot deny the fact that when you say it is, I am sound mind, so it can test that, put you through a, a psych eval. But if I'm sound mind and of age, you know, it is my will and intent, that, that fundamental fact of law, that your will is always spoken, cannot be usurped. So I think what you're saying is a great idea, but I would caution that it needs to be carefully considered. And I even consider that the only thing that needs to be given is notice of the existence of your will. That's all the court needs to have, is that you are giving notice on the public record that... Uh, your will exists and that you have by your will appointed XYZ as the occupant of general executor and then of course from that point on the general executor can by warrant appoint the administrator. That's what I would right. do. Yeah? Yeah, and the only reason I was saying, uh, you know, of course he, 
the only reason I was going to say that is uh, to annex it is so that you're not jumping them in advance. They've seen this document before we enter the court, so I don't want to jump them with anything and get them all mad. And, you know, so I, I th that's what the reason why I was thinking of doing that. But yeah, you're probably right. Better to have a notice in that file of the existence of a will that's on the public that is public. Well, we had a thing last night. I was talking uh, a couple of chats with. Um, uh, with Matt Yoz on a couple of audios which which are available in different places and it was a concept of deed to notary is what notice to the public record is for the corporate system yeah mm -hmm. so in a sense um, we see a transition into the modern system now where the notice and the giving of notice and the repeating giving of notice is what the corporation rests on and that the notary system which they've maintained but ceremonially they're more than happy for us to put all our eggs into the notary system because that keeps us completely preoccupied with um, unfortunately what is not actually written into their procedures their rules and their statutes so yeah I think that's a great idea about giving notice and not gazumping them Thanks again. Hey, you mentioned Matt. What was that last name you had a conversation with? Oh, Matt Yoz is his name. He's uh, one of the, a great researcher in one of the groups uh, and has been doing a lot of deep diving into Will's Testament estate. And you probably hear me do a few audios occasionally with him that are available through the Skype groups and oh, yeah. uh, occasionally they get posted on University of Acadia. But I just wanted to mention because we spoke about that the other night. All right, thank you very much. Okay, good on you. Thanks. Yep, bye now. Bye. Um, got a question here from Galactic Sojourner. Uh, Frank, would my activities as an alchemist producing life force elements be viewed as collateral for your Kata banking system? Zero point energy. Um, look, I, I, I read that question out because, uh, well, all questions are accepted, but also to express and, and explained that the underlying energy, the underlying collateral of the supreme financial system in Yucadia is the same as it is for the current system. The, if you go and look at the Roman canon law, it's worth going and looking at the Vatican. Go and look at the Vatican's Roman canon law. Look for indulgence. If you go and look at indulgence, the premise of all negotiable instruments in the world today is still based on the premise of the existence of the treasury of heaven that a treasury exists in heaven full of credit created by the blood of martyrs and that it is the transaction of credit to offset the debt of sin that is the underlying currency and transaction of the current system believe it or not it still is today that is the same mechanism here and it is the uh, conveyance of equitable title of the divine trust of deceased members that creates a supreme uh, trust which is one supreme credo so that's that's the energy there uh, we don't necessarily then have to get into zero point energy um, as much as I appreciate your question uh, Galactic Sojourner so I would say go and have a look at the covenant read that material uh, because we don't need to necessarily come up with some brand new idea. The existing system is based on this principle.